Being in the position of HR can put you in the uncomfortable position of representing two sides, both of which you care about. And that can place a strain on your ability to build positive relationships. But you need positive relationships to be an effective HR manager. To make things even tougher, because many of your responsibilities involve confidential information, employees may get the feeling you're a secret keeper. And because you deal with negative things like discipline and termination, some might think you are a dangerous person to get too close to. But the truth is, you have to build trust with everyone you interact with. The more they trust you, the more they will know you are always doing what's best, even when they don't agree with it. You don't want people questioning your motives. You want them to trust that you can, will, and are doing the right thing. There are four behaviors that will help you earn the trust you need to be an effective HR manager. The first is consistency in everything you do. HR matters are rarely black and white because there are so many factors involved, and one answer will never fit all solutions. Through all the gray areas, be as consistent as you can. If one employee is reprimanded for acting like a bully, then anyone who acts that way must also be. If a manager wants you to bend the rules for one of their favorite employees, the answer is no, because you'd have to bend the rules for everyone. Further, if you continually change your stance on some issue or your core values change depending on who you're talking to, then people will learn you are not reliable. You have to remain consistent, as consistently as you can. Second, always be fair. You're a person, and that means you'll likely find yourself building closer relationships with some over others. Those people may come to you with gossip or personal issues as a friend, and in those situations you must explain that while you want to be supportive, you can't play favorites. Third, you have to be available to the staff and managers. That means you have to make time for people who show up in your office. You have to be an active listener who gives your full attention, makes eye contact, asks questions, and paraphrases to ensure you heard it right. People should leave meetings with you knowing that they got your full attention and your empathy and that you will be consistent and fair in your next move. Finally, involve employees as much as you can when things you're doing affect their well-being. For example, conducting surveys to learn about job satisfaction and then soliciting their help for ideas on how to increase job satisfaction makes a difference. Obviously, they can't be involved in everything you do, but when it makes sense, seek their input. In the end, trust is based on perception, and perceptions continually change. As employees and managers observe you in meetings and conversations, read your emails, and find out what you stand for, their perceptions of you will change slightly all throughout the day. Follow the steps I provided, be mindful of how you communicate, and you should be just fine. An audit is a great way to ensure the things you are responsible for are compliant and up to date. In conducting your audit, the first thing you want to do is create a checklist of all things HR. For that reason, the next thing you should do is create an audit plan. The plan will help you stay on track. The first part is the scope. Depending on what you are auditing, you may say, in that no audit of human resources has ever been conducted, this audit will cover all things HR. Or you might decide the scope is limited to something more specific, such as, this audit aims to determine compliance and uniformity in compensation, benefits, and classification. The next section of your audit plan will be about logistics. In other words, spend some time brainstorming how and where you will get the information you need for your audit. For example, if ensuring employees are correctly classified as exempt or not exempt as a goal, then you'll probably need to spend some time with employees interviewing them about their jobs. So let them know in advance you will need some of their time. This leads me to the next item in your audit plan, which is a timeline. As you're reviewing the checklist and figuring out what you will audit and how, also consider when you will audit each section. That way, if you need employee time, for example, you can give them plenty of advance warning. A timeline also ensures you stay on task and complete the audit within a reasonable time frame. A quick note about communication. If you do find it will be necessary to spend time with employees or poke around the business in places you don't normally go, you could make people feel uncomfortable about why you're doing that. Before you start your audit, communicate about it with transparency. You could send an email out letting people know you need to spend some time understanding what's happening in HR. Employees just need some assurance you aren't auditing the business in order to recommend people for layoffs, for example. I know the audit plan can sound a little daunting, and you may be thinking, I've got this checklist, so I'll just get started. Yes, you could do that, but the audit plan can make the process more streamlined and ensure you cover everything. Doing the audit with just the checklist in hand will get results, but you may miss something. 
So take a few hours to write out your plan, get your checklist in order, and then go and get started. To be or not to be, that is the question. That's from Shakespeare's Hamlet. In the case of HR, the question you must answer for all of your employees is to be or not to be full-time, part-time, hourly, salaried, exempt, or non-exempt. So let's dig into the answers. The most obvious difference between full-time and part-time employees is hours. In most companies, a full-time employee works more than 32 hours per week, while a part-time employee works less than that. Now let's look at an employee to understand how pay structure and overtime works with full and part-timers. Let's say Nick is a receptionist. Whether Nick is a part-time or full-time receptionist, you can pay him an hourly rate or a salary. So how do you determine which way to pay him? Well, if Nick's hours were constantly pushing him into overtime and his duties meant that he's often staying an extra 15 minutes, hour, or a few hours later than his schedule, you'd be better off paying him hourly because you need him to punch a time clock to correctly determine his overtime pay. If he regularly works the same hours all week, every week, you may decide a salary is easier because you don't have to deal with time cards and calculating hours worked. No matter how you pay him, as a receptionist, Nick's duties likely do not make him exempt from overtime pay. So whether you pay him on a salary basis or hourly, and whether he's part-time or full-time, if Nick works over eight hours in a day or over 40 hours in a week, he receives overtime pay. So there's a few misconceptions about salary I'd like to clear up. The first is that a salary automatically means exempt from overtime, but that's not how it works. Exempt or non-exempt status is determined by an employee's primary job duties, not by how their payroll is calculated. Employees are only exempt from receiving overtime pay if they meet certain requirements put forward by the Fair Labor Standards Act, or FLSA. The most common exemptions are administrative, executive, computer professionals, and outside sales employees. Nick doesn't meet the exemption requirements as a receptionist, so no matter if he's paid on an hourly basis or on a salary, he gets overtime pay. The second misconception is that salaried employees do not get their pay deducted if they leave early for the day. In Nick's case, because he's not exempt, his salary should be deducted if he leaves early. Salary doesn't mean free pass to come and go as you please. Now let's fast forward 10 years and say that Nick has worked his way to Director of Operations. Nick manages a few people, has a say in their employment at the company, and makes decisions that greatly impact the organization. Now, Nick's duties fit within the executive exemption. In other words, his job duties make him exempt from overtime pay. So no matter how many hours he works in a week, he will not be paid overtime. Note that Nick will also be a salaried employee at this point because being salaried is one of the requirements for exemption per FLSA. Again, it's Nick's job duties that make him exempt, not the fact that he's salaried. In the end, according to the Society for Human Resources Management, or SHRM, misclassifying employees is the number one mistake made in HR, and there's so many rules around overtime that it's easy to get confused. But once you've classified your employees, it's a good idea to ask an employment law attorney to review all of your job descriptions and the classification you assign them. Your organization's most powerful asset is its people. Compensating them for their contributions is a critical part to attracting, motivating, and retaining employees so your business can grow. To determine what to pay your employees for their work and how to reward them for their successes, there are several things to consider. First is your organization's culture. For example, if there is emphasis on teamwork and collaboration, you'll likely provide similar benefits across all levels and deliver standard pay increases annually. If the emphasis is on individual performance, your pay structure might include bonuses for reaching individual goals. Also consider the needs of your workforce. What benefits will they find valuable given their particular age, skills, and experience? Also think about your industry. Does the pay you offer have to match your competitors in order for you to retain top talent? Not necessarily, but you'd have to offer something to offset that. Finally, consider internal equity. You must have some clear guidelines about how you compensate for different levels of education, experience, special skill sets, and productivity. If two people with the same job make different amounts of money, you have to justify why one makes more than the other. Once you've gathered this general information, you need to determine pay structure, and there are several options. 
Many organizations offer base pay, which comes in the form of an hourly wage or a salary. Employees either get paid for each hour they clock in, or they receive a set amount each month regardless of hours worked. Other organizations, generally those with union presence, offer flat rate pay, which means everyone in a particular job receives the same pay regardless of seniority or performance. You could also choose to offer performance-based pay, which means an employee's own performance dictates the amount of raises and when those raises are received. If you go this route, you absolutely have to be sure you can connect performance to pay, and you have to be able to address employees' arguments that they performed better than they're getting credit for. Another option is productivity-based pay, which means that employees get paid for items produced. This might be a good option if your workers are performing a task based on pieces. A factory worker might receive an hourly wage and an additional 50 cents for every item they assemble, for example. Personally, I'm a fan of doing a mixture of base pay and performance pay. You might pay your customer service reps an hourly rate, but provide a bonus or extra incentive when their quality scores are above 95% or if they answer a certain number of calls above quota. But again, you always have to be sure that what you're offering for performance is a motivator for employees, otherwise it won't make a difference in their performance. The bottom line is that there are a lot of ways to pay your employees, and there are a lot of payroll nuances, such as taxable wages, Social Security, and health insurance. For that reason, many small businesses hire a payroll specialist to help, or use a payroll software that can run calculations for them, and I recommend you consider doing the same. The Corporate Policy Handbook is probably one of the first things that comes to mind when people think about human resources. We are indeed tied to this book as it serves as the law inside your organization. And sometimes you are the judge and jury as you hold people accountable to it. But that doesn't mean it has to read like stereo instructions. If you haven't already, a great place to start is to purchase a template from one of the many HR compliance websites out there. Your employment law attorney may also have a template to offer you or at least some suggestions on where to get one. Once you have a template, go through it page by page and make adjustments to suit your company's policies as well as your organizational culture. You'll want to include a letter from your CEO and your organization's vision, mission, and core values up at the front. Your performance management and disciplinary procedures may need some tweaking and so forth. Also make sure your organization's code of conduct is at the beginning. Anyone joining your organization who receives this handbook on their first day of work will need to know right up front what's expected of them in terms of behavior. You can even offer that page up in your interviews with candidates to find out whether it suits their personality. Your handbook should be written in a formal way, but it must be understandable. So it should be clear and concise, but it should also match the tone of your organization. For instance, a handbook in an attorney's office likely has a different tone than one in a startup tech company. If you're in that startup, you'll need to find the balance between firm, concise language and the free spirit that comes with that line of work. Another recommendation is to keep it simple and easy to read, and then as your organization grows, you can update things as needed. Handbooks are meant to be revised, so don't be afraid to do so. When you make those changes, be sure to mark the date and revision number in a footer that appears on all pages and communicate the exact change and where it can be found to all organizational members. In some cases, you'll want to obtain a newly signed acknowledgement, and for others, that may not be needed. For example, an updated harassment policy needs a signed acknowledgement that it was received. An updated policy that the day after Thanksgiving will now be an official corporate holiday probably does not. Of course, any new hire should also sign an acknowledgement of receipt of the handbook. Pay attention to the way your handbook looks. In the old days, a 100-page document with no pictures was the standard. But technology has changed the way we process information. So much information passes by our desk each and every day. If you want people to actually review your policies, you need to grab their attention. Have a little fun with it. Perhaps bright orange headers are appropriate for your organizational culture. Or a picture of a person using a cell phone could be included on the page where your cell phone's at work policy appears. Finally, be sure to have your employment law attorney review your handbook. There are many things you can't include, such as prohibiting people from talking about their salary or prohibiting posts on social media about your company. As long as they aren't posting confidential information, employees can indeed complain about you online. All the more reason to secure a fair, respectful workplace where your employees can thrive. On that note, remember that all of your policies must be enforced consistently and fairly. So go and get started, and don't be afraid to have a little fun with your company's handbook.
As an HR manager, you get to help drive your organization's success by helping your team be the best they can be. And sometimes driving your organization's success is all about compliance. That's where documentation comes in. HR is the record keeper of employee performance, advancement, career development, discipline, benefits, bonuses, and everything in between. I hate to say it, but in the end, the purpose of all that documentation is to protect your organization from liability. If an employee files a suit against you for violation of any employment laws, the cornerstone of that case will be your documentation. Now, you can always try to convince yourself that a suit would never happen to your company. Everyone loves working there, you all get along, the CEO is awesome, and there's just no way someone would ever do that. You could say the same thing about wearing your seatbelt when you drive, that you'll never get in an accident. But we all know that car accidents happen every day. So wear your seatbelt and be a thorough and consistent documenter of all things HR. There are many state and federal laws about what, how, and where you should document, so I can't provide you with all of the rules, but I can give you some guidance. Of course, when you begin the process of hiring a new employee, the documentation begins. You must keep all of the resumes you receive and the interview notes from that round of hiring just in case someone who wasn't hired claims you discriminated against them. Several federal laws indicate you should keep those documents for one year, but some states have their own number. I suggest five. Especially if it's all electronic, why get rid of them at all? Once you've made the hire, then the employee will fill out and sign many documents, such as the I-9, W-4, confidentiality form, and acknowledgement of receipt of the corporate policy handbook on their first day. Know that not all of the employee's information belongs in a single personnel file, mostly because content is confidential from supervisors and managers. Any drug test or background check results should be kept in their own file, one for each employee. I-9 should be kept together in their own folder, and separate payroll files for each employee will include W-4s, state withholding forms, garnishments, and timekeeping records. Employee personnel files will include all of the hiring documents, such as applications, resumes, and transcripts. Personnel files will also include records relating to job offers, promotions, and demotions, compensation, and training. Any kind of acknowledgement of receiving policies and any documentation about performance, disciplinary actions, and termination will also go in the personnel file. You should not be on your own when it comes to documentation. Your managers and supervisors should be trained and encouraged to document both good performance and performance issues. Free-flowing communication about performance is important to your organization's success, and documentation about this communication is vital. Obviously, managers won't document every time they say good job to someone or every time they ask Sue to try to be on time. But encourage them to keep some notes on these things. When it makes sense, they should log achievements and problems. When they talk to employees about their performance, they should document it in some way, whether by sending you an email or putting a note in a file in their own computer. Advise your managers and supervisors that specific, detailed documentation is much better than subjective or evaluative comments. Judy did not finish the report she was assigned on time, it was due June 10, but she turned it in on June 30, is much better than Judy's work was late. Finally, managers and supervisors, and you, must remember to document issues consistently. Consistency is one of your shields against lawsuits. When in doubt, document. If you're confused by all of the who, what, when, where, and why regarding documentation, you're not alone. Use your employment law attorney as a support, and there are many resources online, too. A good place to start might be the Society for Human Resources Management at shrm.org, or search online for a checklist regarding your state's documentation requirements. There's a variety of laws that really impact you on a regular basis as an HR professional. They are in place to ensure employees are treated fairly and with dignity at work. Before we get started, it's important for me to state that I am not an attorney and therefore I am not providing legal advice. This video is for informational purposes only and is meant to give you basic information about five laws you should be aware of if you're going to serve in the HR function. It is your responsibility to learn and understand all federal and state laws related to human resources and to implement the appropriate processes to ensure your organization is in compliance of those laws. Always, always consult an employment law attorney if you are unsure about something. 
The first law I want to cover is the Family Medical Leave Act, or FMLA. FMLA requires employers with 50 or more employees to provide eligible employees up to 12 weeks of unpaid, job-protected leave. Employees will need FMLA leave, for instance, when they have a child or adopt a child, when their spouse receives orders for an emergency deployment, or if they have an immediate family member who needs medical assistance. Employees will also use FMLA when they have their own medical issues and need time off to attend doctor's appointments or recover. The Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, ensures people with disabilities are treated fairly and with respect. ADA requires employers with 15 or more employees to make reasonable accommodations for those who need them. Examples include building a ramp over a small flight of stairs, providing a wheelchair accessible desk, or reassigning a minor job duty to another employee. The Occupational Safety and Health Act, or OSHA, was passed in order to encourage employers and employees to ensure a safe and healthy work environment. OSHA states that employees have the right to demand safety and health, to file a complaint when something is unsafe or unhealthy, and to request an investigation. As an employer, you should be proactive and advise your workforce of hazards and remove them. Also be sure to provide training when it's necessary. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, more commonly known simply as Title VII, prohibits harassment and discrimination on the basis of sex, race, nationality, religion, age, disability, or genetic information. These are called protected classes. Be aware that many states have their own longer list of protected classes, so make sure to research your state laws. Discrimination occurs when an employer or employee treats some groups more favorably than others. An example might be giving bonuses to males because they are male, rather than because of their performance, or not hiring a woman because she is pregnant. Harassment is unwelcome conduct that is a condition of employment or is so severe a reasonable person would find it hostile and abusive. Examples include offensive jokes, mocking a person, interfering with their work performance, and physical assaults or threats. Sexual harassment is also addressed in Title VII. The law states that no one should have to submit to sexual harassment in order to stay employed or to receive benefits, and that no one should have to endure an intimidating or sexually offensive work environment. Finally, Title VII prohibits retaliation for filing a claim or participating in any sort of proceeding, such as an investigation or a lawsuit. The last law I want to discuss is the Fair Labor Standards Act, or FLSA. This is the federal law used to classify employees versus independent contractors, determine which employees are exempt from overtime and which are not, and it dictates minimum wage. But make sure you check your own state's Where did you get your job descriptions? Did you locate a template online and download it? Did you ask around to see if colleagues had something you could tailor to make your own? This is always a great place to start, but there's more to writing job descriptions than adding your company name and logo to a template. First, let's understand the purpose of a job description. They are invaluable documents because they are used for so many things, including recruiting, determining salary, and setting performance expectations. You can also use them for career planning, training, compliance, and establishing organizational hierarchy. Before writing the job description, you must perform a job analysis. This simply means that you spend some time really understanding the job so you can write an accurate description. An analysis may include observing an employee, interviewing them about their duties, or having employees fill out questionnaires. You could also interview managers and supervisors, review salary surveys and industry best practices, or sift through personnel files. Once you understand the job, you are ready to write the job description. The first step is to establish the essential functions. Essential job functions is a term related to the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, and will help you evaluate requests for accommodation from employees with disabilities. To determine the essential job functions, first consider what tasks are truly necessary or required to do that job. The tasks that are performed frequently cannot be redesigned or reassigned to other employees, and that would be detrimental to the organization if they aren't performed, are the essential job functions. Those should appear in their own section on the job description. 
The next step in writing the description is to write a one or two sentence objective for the job. For example, a retail store manager's objective might read, responsible for guest services and overall operation of the store, including measuring business trends, maximizing sales and profits, developing staff, and all aspects of merchandising. The objective is a concise statement that sums up the entire document. Now you're ready to fill in the rest. As you write your descriptions, here are a few tips to keep in mind in the writing process. You should use a writing style that suits the culture of your organization. Your description might be more formal in a law office, for example, versus a startup tech firm. Either way, the writing should be impersonal and explicit. Next, make sure you are concise. Once you've written it, go back and evaluate what is most important to be included and what you can eliminate. Also, be specific when it makes sense. For example, your own job description might say processes payroll bi-weekly as opposed to frequently processes payroll. Also focus on critical activities as opposed to minor tasks. For example, if the bookkeeper happens to pick up the phone once in a while, that task does not belong in the job description. But if he was the designated backup for the receptionist, answering phones may belong in there. Make sure to begin each duty or task with an action verb and always use present tense. Also be sure to use unbiased terminology. For instance, try to craft sentences that don't use gender specific terms. Finally, include a page number, revision date, and number, and your initials at the bottom. In the end, always remember to be flexible with job descriptions. They can and should be revised as the organization and its people change and grow. Jobs are fluid, and so are job descriptions. First there were newspaper ads. Then came the internet with job boards. Now recruiting has exploded into full-blown marketing. Post and pray is in the past, and it's time to get serious in your recruiting efforts. Recruiting is a process of figuring out where your potential employees are and encouraging them to apply. This is no different than marketing, which is the process of figuring out where your potential customers are and encouraging them to buy. As you come up with your recruiting strategy, you want to think about employment branding or your company's image when it comes to candidates and employees. If you have a marketing department at your organization, ask them for help as you build your employment brand. One way to build your brand is with your job posting. All too often, small businesses post the job description instead of creating a separate job advertisement. Think of job descriptions like a stereo manual. If you were shopping for a new stereo online, would you buy from a company who posted the manual, or would you buy from the company who lists the stereo's best features with pictures and positive customer reviews? So your job posting should read like an advertisement rather than a job description. Start with an eye-catching opening line or question. Seeking fearless leader to boldly take our sales team where they have never gone before is better than seeking an experienced sales manager. Use language that matches your organizational culture and you'll attract people who will fit in. Only use boring and mundane language if you want boring and mundane people to apply. Something else you could try is providing a link to a short YouTube clip introducing you and your company. You might even ask employees to talk about why they love working for your company and make those clips available too. Be sure to include the minimum requirements, but don't get caught up in all of the preferred attributes or you might turn off great candidates. Remember the goal is to cast a wide net to collect as many top quality candidates as you can, so getting too specific can create a big den in your pool. Have fun with some of those minimum requirements. You might say, please don't apply if you aren't awesome, don't have five years sales experience, and hate math. Obviously, part of recruiting is figuring out where you will find your candidates. There are certainly plenty of job boards online, and that might be a good place to start. But I encourage you to get more creative and proactive. You could actually go looking for the right candidates on LinkedIn or other social media sites, rather than posting an advertisement and hoping they come to you. You never want to feel like you chose a candidate because they were the best of the just okay candidates you had available. Also try advertising in places where your candidates might be. If you're a gaming company, maybe you advertise on gaming store websites. Try attending events other than job fairs. What random community events are happening that would draw the people you're looking for? You might also try unconventional newspaper ads, such as in a local LGBT magazine or church newsletter. Really, the options for recruiting are endless. Now, with all of these options, it's easy to become unorganized in your efforts. Make a list of all of the potential places you might go recruiting 
and pick the top three most promising. Try those three avenues, and if you're not getting the kind of top quality candidates you expected, it might be time to make some tweaks to one avenue or abandon it and try a totally different one. In other words, be strategic in where you're looking and keep track of which recruiting efforts are working or not. That way you can be sure you're only spending time looking in the places that get you the best results. And have fun. You already know that the interview is a crucial part of the hiring process, so preparing for that very important step is even more important. Lack of preparation can lead to a bad hire, and bad hires cost the organization in time and money. One mistake many small businesses fall into is desperation for a warm body. The receptionist quit, the phones are ringing, and there's no one to answer them. Let's just get somebody in here! Step away from those feelings. If, after you interview potential candidates, no one person stands out as the best match, then you should continue to recruit and interview candidates until the best match is located. It's just not worth it to have a warm body who will soon quit or be fired. Understandably, your staff may be frustrated with your decision to hold off, but remind them that training and onboarding is time consuming, so it's better to only do it once for the right person. So take the time to understand the job and what a successful candidate needs, and then you are ready to write your interview questions. In addition to the standard questions you can easily locate online, you should also include about five behavior-based interview questions. The question, how do you handle stress, is hypothetical, and you will get a hypothetical answer. Instead, try, tell me about a time you were under a lot of stress at work. What was the situation, and how did you handle it? This question requires the candidate to offer up an example or story about a time they actually dealt with stress. And of course, you will ask follow-up questions and probe to learn as much as you can. Work with the person who will supervise this position you are filling. Determine three to five absolute requirements a person needs to be successful, and then write your questions. Remember, they start with, tell me about a time. Something else to figure out is the critical success factor. This is the one trader skill a person absolutely must have or the consequences for your company would be enormous. Use the phone interview strategically. Ask a few questions about the resume, find out how much they made at their last job, their salary requirements, and why they applied. Also pay attention to things other than their answers. If you called them on their cell phone and caught them off guard, do they ask for a few moments to sit down and get out a pen and paper? Or do they try to wing it? Are they giving you their full attention or are they distracted? If you get their voicemail, is it professional? As you're preparing to interview your candidates in person, decide the best format and be clear on your reasons for using that format. If you're trying to hire several people for several open positions, perhaps a group interview is best. You might also use a panel interview if you need to hire quickly and would like to avoid having that person come back for second interviews with someone else. The key to successful panel interviews, or several interviewers interviewing one candidate, is that you get together before the interview to agree on who will ask which questions and who will take the lead. You might also decide observing employees doing the work might be a part of your interview process, or going out into the field with your best salesperson, for example, might be useful. You could also ask your receptionist to strike up a conversation with candidates while they wait for you to call them in, and then you could get some insight onto how they acted when their guard was down. In the end, interviews are strategic events that include preparation, discussion, and a well-thought-out plan. Finding the right person can really make a big difference in the success of your company.